Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. My name is Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is two-time backgammon world champion and prolific writer in backgammon, poker, and chess, Bill Roberti. Today, we're going to discuss his brand new book, How to Play the Opening in Backgammon, Part 2, Everything Matters. Bill Roberti, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Happy to be back, folks. Happy to have you. Before we give you a question, uh, we have a memorial. Um, Richard, why don't you start it off? Um, yeah, I, I found out uh, recently that Stan Thompson died last month. Um, Stan Thompson was both a giant in the backgammon world, but also uh, even more so in the sports betting world. Uh, he was the brains behind Pinnacle Sports, which is sort of the premier uh, offshore sports book for decades now. Um, and uh, he was one of the people that was nice enough to be interviewed for my book, Gambling Wizards. Uh, we couldn't talk about his involvement in Pinnacle Sports in that book. That would have been a really interesting interview in and of itself. But, uh, you know, for legal reasons, we couldn't do that. So um, if you haven't read that interview, it's it's more about his early gambling days and being part of the first, uh, not just backgammon, but part of the first computer group that um, used computers to just massacre sports betting. So uh, he will be missed. He's somebody I tried to get on this show a couple of times, and um, he just wasn't willing to do it. So uh, I'm sorry we missed that opportunity, and I'm sorry he's gone. I never met Stan Thompson, but my relationship with him is secondhand. He was the guru to the biggest cheat around when I was learning backgammon. Uh, Gabby Horowitz hung out at the Cavendish West in Los Angeles, and Gabby swore that Stanley Thompson wanted Gabby to teach him how to make checkers disappear so he could protect himself against other cheats, and in return, he taught Gabby how to play backgammon. So Gabby raved about him. Everything he thought Thompson was the greatest backgammon player in the world, which he may well have been. Uh, I never met the man, but I would have liked to. So, uh, Bill Roberti, when you were last on our program, you discussed part one of this backgammon opening moves series. How is part two different from part one? Uh, it's different only that it's a continuation. It, it addresses different issues, different, you know, problems that come up. Uh, it sort of moves on from book one, which was uh, which was solely about the key points and when you make them and when you don't make them. The four point, the five point, the, your opponent's four and five points. Um, it focused entirely on that, uh, plus an introduction to how you play the opening moves and the replies and stuff. Um, this book is about other points on the board that have their own importance. Um, the three point, the opponent's three point outfield points, and the always controversial ace and deuce points. Um, so it's about that. It's about those points, when you make them, when you don't make them. Um, and in addition, the other part of the book is about the general topic of hitting loose in your inner board. Um, your opponent splits to your five point, and then you have an option to hit him there or not, and when do you do it, when don't you do it. Um, so it's those, those two sort of big topics now are, are the subject of this book. Other points on the board besides the very key, most important points, and also the whole idea of when do you attack your opponent in your inner board and when don't you. So although the books are related, do you believe that they're also standalone? In other words, you can read this book and learn from it even if you haven't read the first one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, you could. Um, I would certainly tell people if they asked me that uh, I'd suggest reading the first book first and the second book afterwards. But you don't have to do it. The, the book is self-contained and, um, you know, it's about a series of topics. The the number of topics involved in the opening were large enough so that it's a three book series. 
And, uh, you know, book one started you off, book two carries on, and book three hopefully finishes with a bang. So who's your intended audience for this series? Tournament it's players, so beginners, intermediate? It's not, it's not for beginners. Um, beginner could read it and and they get something out of it, but you really, you want someone who's played a fair amount before they read these books. Um, I would say it's for strong intermediate players and uh, open players of pretty much any level. Um, it's not just about, you know, what do you do in this in this position? What's the right answer? It's about how do you think about backgammon in the opening and in general? What what sort of things go through your head as you try to figure out over the board a, a non-obvious move? Which, um, which is really much more important than one particular move, but that ability, how do you sort of approach positions from a macro scale and think about these kinds of things so that if you don't know a particular move, you have a way of solving the problem over the board. Exactly right. Um, you know, I, Will you encounter the exact positions in this book over the board and say, ah, that was on page 134 of book two. I know what to do here. Unlikely. Um, even if I encountered one of these, I might not remember that it was in the book. But if you know how to think about positions, um, then you're well on the way to being able to narrow the choice down. And at least even if you pick the wrong play, it, it shouldn't be wrong by too much. Eventually, if you play enough, you just get a sense of where your checkers belong. And a lot of the plays in this book to a top class player would be obvious. They, he would just look at this and say, oh, OK, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do this or that. Oh, well, this is clearly better. I do it. Um, no further for a top player. No further thought process would be necessary for many of these positions. Um, but if you're not a top player, you're going to have to work through these a little bit. And, and I'm, in the book, I think I teach you how to do that. You know, what are the issues? What are you looking for? Um, and, you know, a preponderance of the things that you're considering favor one play over another. So you say, OK, I'll do play A. That must be that must be must be best here. Were there many well, were there many plays that were counterintuitive that surprised you? Um, oh sure. Well, counter counterintuitive to my intuition at the time. <laughs> I've worked on this for a long time, so my intuition has has changed uh, over the years. But um, yeah, I, certainly there were positions in here that were um, at first surprising to me, and then as I thought about them and figured it out, uh, looked at rollout results, looked at how individual moves play. Eventually, they, they came to seem not so surprising. Um, but that's what you that's what I would want a reader to do as they read through these, to get to a point finishing the book where uh, stuff that used to be puzzling now doesn't look so puzzling. Well, on this process, I mean, you've been world class for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. How much does did the process of collecting and writing this all down improve your game if at all oh i think it improved it substantially um real well don't forget i had gotten rusty in backgammon because i took several years out to do poker uh and dan harrington and i wrote all those books together so and i really wasn't playing much backgammon at all in that period so when i when we were done with poker and i decided okay time to go back to backgammon um i was rusty and, uh, you know, I, I, I was not playing as well as I had, let's say, in 01, 02, you know, 03. So I, I was, you know, getting back into the game, practicing, playing and stuff. And then, uh, uh, you know, my game kind of rebuilt itself from there. But this book, these books were done in the last six years. And uh, I think they made a big difference. Um, I, I, I'm much less... I'll say awkward at the board in terms of, you know, looking at possibilities and seeing which ones are really um, and which ones I can dismiss and which ones are, are serious contenders uh, and then figuring out sorting among the serious contenders to get to the best play. 
Um, I think I'm, I'm just better now than I was five or six years ago. So let's go over some of the factors as, as one example. Uh, in the first chapter of this book, which is actually called chapter six, because chapters one through five were in book one. Right. You discuss making your own three point versus your opponent's three point, which is also called the 22 point. Right. So you can't give positions over the radio. But generally, what kind of things should you be thinking about when you decide if which to do when you can make either of those points, but not both? Uh, OK, um, well, oddly enough, it turns out it's almost never the case that you have to choose between the three or the 22. Um, whatever role is going to make the 22 is almost certainly not going to be a role that makes the three point on your side. So what you're doing here is you're saying, OK, uh, I can make the three point or I can make some other point. Uh, I can make a three point or I can hit somewhere. Uh, I can make the three point or I can just split my back checkers and move around. Um, and the same goes up for the 22 point on the other side of the board. Um, you So uh, what factors into it? The, the 22 point is sort of easier because it's an anchor, but it's not a strong anchor. It's not like the 20 or the 21 points, which are considerably better, or the 18, which is considerably better. Um, so if you're going to anchor on the 22 point, a couple of things need to have happened. Um, first of all, your opponent has to have developed an offensive position of some strength. If he's got nothing, if he's still in the starting position, you don't need the 22 yet. Uh, most likely you're probably doing something on your side of the board. Um, so he's got some position that's strong enough. So you're thinking I could get blitzed here and maybe it's time to button up. Even though the 22 is not a super good anchor, it'll, it's any port in a storm time. Uh, so I'll do that. There are things that tell you not to make the 22. Uh, most importantly, does your opponent have his nine point, which is six pips away from his three point, which is your 22 point? If he's got the nine point, you really don't want to make the 22 because you're moving into a blocked position. You're moving into a position where you can't run out with sixes. Since he's got his eight and his six, you can't run out with fives and fours. So you're you're going to a place where you're potentially stuck. OK, that's that's a very big deal. Um Aside from that, it's it's really that you you have some need for defense and you don't have a play B on the other side of the board that's particularly good. All of these all of these choices have to be made against the, the question of what's the other play? How good is the second best is the second play that you're looking at? And if you've got a strong alternative to the 22 on your side of the board, you're probably going to make that play instead. Um, but if you don't. And you need an anchor, 22 sitting there, you say, and, and he hasn't got you blocked in any more than he ordinarily would. Then you say, OK, I'm going to take the 22. Um, the three point is it's just a, it's a good point to have. You need a strong alternative not to make it. Um, you might need very much to split your back checkers, for example. That might overweigh the need for the three point. Um, if you've got the five or the four, the three goes up in value because now you've got uh, a, a position of three good points in your home board. That's a plus. Um, and again, what's play B? Um, if play B isn't particularly strong, then, you know, the three points going to be OK. But it's always this balancing act. You know, you've got something you can do. Make the three, make the 22. What is play B is the most important thing. And. You're viewing these different plays in terms of, you know, what's going on in the position? Are there stacks that need to be unstacked? Are there points that will get stripped if I do this? Do I have to break a point to do something? Uh, all of that stuff is, is percolating away in the back of your head, and it's affecting how you view these plays. And hopefully at the end of the day, you, you put it all together and you say, OK, pretty clearly points to the three, pretty clearly points to the 22. Um, 
Or if it's a toss up, eh, well, then you just do what you want because you've done you've done all you can do. And now just pick one and go with it. Good. That that kind of th how you think about it is the strongest part of this book, I think. Um, I learned to play in the mid 70s and read Paul McGreal's masterpiece. Strong proponent of the of the golden point, which is your opponent's five point. So I would make that quickly. Now, over the years, McGreal changed his mind a little bit on the golden point. How did that happen? Uh, what we know about this is contained in the introduction to to the reprint of Paul's book. Uh, Paul's first wife, Renee, who was instrumental in getting the book into book form and published. Um, records a comment from Paul before that reprint was done in the early 2000s. And he said he'd made a mistake. He said uh, the all the playing experience that he had between the mid 70s and the mid 90s uh, had convinced him that the 18 point, your opponent's bar point, was actually better than the 20 and deserved to be the true golden point. And there was nothing beyond that comment to back it up. Uh, it went into the preface, to the, the introduction to the, the reprint of his book, and, and it sat there for a long time. Uh, I never asked Paul about it. I, I ran into him many times, but it never came up. And then in 2018, he died, so no more asking was going to happen. Uh, so in this book, I, I got the idea. It was a nice break from... What had gone before, I said, hey, look, uh, let's let's tackle this problem. So chapter seven was about outfield points, including the two bar points. And I said, oh, that's a good place to stick this in. So uh, in a for for math buffs, uh, I, I put in a little nod to Fermat's last theorem. I said uh, I called it McGreal's last theorem and said, well, which of these two points is better? And answering that question is a little tricky because. It turns out, see, normally you would, if you wanted to know, is this point more important than that point, you would look at some positions where you could make point A or point B, and you could compare them directly and, and see, well, it seems like in most positions A is better than B, so that's okay. But there are no positions. The 20-point the, uh, the, the and the 18-point are on the same side of the board, and they have different pip counts. So there's not going to be any plays where you could make the 20 or the 18 without some ancillary effect occurring somewhere else in the board because you had some other part of your role to play. And I give a couple of examples of this in the book just to show why this is not a trivial problem. You just can't set up a position where you've got a 5-4 to play and, and you, know, you can make the 20 or the 18. There, there, are, no such, there are no such plays. So what I did was I found positions where you could make the 20 or a point on the other side of the board, and then a very similar position where you could make the 18 or a point on the other side of the board, like the 20 versus the 5 point or the 18 versus the 5 point. So I collected some pairs of positions like that, and I it's the old it's the old math adage, if you... If you can't compare A to B directly, but if you, you but you can compare A to C and B to C, well, that might that might solve your problem. And in all of these pairings that I found, uh, making the 18 point was indeed a little better than making the 20 point. So I put a couple of examples in the book and and just said Paul was, appears to have been right. Looks like if you looks like the 18 what a surprise. is a better Paul than McGrill was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, he gets. All of us who wrote books back in the 70s or the early 80s, we, we get uh, a fair amount of razzing about because now the computers can tell you whether plays were right or wrong. So we get razzed a little about all the errors that were that were in these books. Um, so I just felt like it was a little homage to Paul. Uh, here's an example of a of a of a difficult problem that he uh, he nailed. Now, a few of the. This is more book one, but a few of the forced initial moves are 3-1, 4-2, and 6-1. Now, they aren't actually forced, of course, but the vast majority of players play them in the same way. 
In this book, you discuss how 6-1 is considerably weaker than either 3-1 or 4-2. Why is that? Two reasons. Um, A, it's not an inner board point. And you are trying to make inner board points at the start of the game so that when you hit your opponent, he's in a lot more trouble than he would be if you didn't. Uh, so that's the first thing in favor of 3-1 and 4-2, they're an inner point. The other is a little more subtle, and I go into this at some length in Chapter 7 in the new book. 6-1, if you, if you ask a beginner who hasn't read anything about the book, what's the best opening roll? He'll often say 6-1 because it makes three points in a row. And if, if making points in a row is a good thing, well, that's the, that's the opening roll that actually gives you three in a row. In fact, when I was taught backgammon, for the very first time by Norman Weinstein, um, he taught me the how to move and and uh, and showed me a couple of opening rolls. And that was my reaction that day. I remember I said, oh, the, the best opening roll must be 6-1 because it makes three in a row. And he gave me a condescending smile and said, well, old son, it's not quite that clear. Actually, the five points is better. Um, but first of all, it's not an it's not an inner board point. That's strike one against it. The more important one is. The position you get after you make the bar point with 6-1 is very awkward to improve. You still have your stack of five checkers on the six point, and now you have the strip seven and you have the strip eight point. So in order for that position to turn into a position where you've got your four and your five and your three, you're going to need to either bring down builders and get lucky. So you can keep the points you started with, or you're going to need to break the point you just made in order to make better ones. For example, if, if you start the game with a 6-1 and make the 7 point, and your opponent does something on the other side of the board, who knows, uh, and then you roll 2-1, your best play is almost certainly going to be to break the 7 and make the 5 point, which now gets the 5 instead of the 7, leaves the 7 slotted, and unstacks the 6. That position that you get is so much better than the 6-1 position uh, that it's almost an automatic play with 2-1. What about with 2-2? Two, two? Do you break the bar and make the 5-4? and four? Yes, almost certainly. And there will be exceptions, but yeah, that's going to be your play. Um, play B is going to be making the 22 and the 4, something like that. Um but yeah, you're, you you like your game a lot better after you've made the four and the five. Now, to determine which play is best, you generally use the XG++ rollouts. And I've got a question about it. The product amazes me. This is a, this is a artificial me too. intelligence, me too. I think. <laughs> it's wonderful. And there are zillions and zillions of ways for a backgammon game to go. It, Including in infinity, there are some infinite loops you can get with definitely possible with probability zero, but definitely possible. Right. But somehow you make a play in the opening and the computer can tell you that this play is worth, say, plus 2.15 and that play is worth only 1.98. And it does it very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, How does it do that given the virtually infinite number of possibilities a game can go? Okay, now we have to dig a little into what are called neural networks, because XG is a neural network. Um, Deep Blue in chess is a neural is a partial neural network. Uh, Alpha Chess um, is a pure neural network applied to chess. Um, so neural networks operate in the following way. Computer programmer designs uh, an evaluation function, which has points and values for every a aspect of the position that he can think about. Um, do you have your five point made? We, you get uh, some coefficient that will go with that. Uh, do you have your four point made? Slightly different coefficient. Uh, what's the race? Different coefficient associated with that. Um, the very first neural network that applied to backgammon was developed by Dr. Jerry Tesoro uh, at, the Emma, at the IBM labs at uh, White Plains. And I actually was his test subject. Uh, after he'd done it, 
thought it was playing pretty well. He flew me out there to, to play against him for a day and give him my evaluation. But going back for a second to this idea of an evaluation function. So you have this function and every item in the function has a coefficient. And each item describes some aspect of a backgammon position. And as I understand it, Tesoro started with something like a uh, hundred different items and coefficients and XG is up around 400. Um, then once you've done that, once you think, okay, I've, I've got all the important features of a position that I can think of, then you start training the program. And that means the program plays itself millions of times. And after each game, it, through some process I can't explain to you, but it, 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 this is what it does. It goes back through the game and it tweaks the coefficients of all these different terms um, to be more in line with the result of the game so that the tweaked coefficients would produce a slightly better result for the side whose coefficients were being tweaked. And then you do it again and again and again. And this endless tweaking process goes on. And at the beginning, the tweaks are getting very big. Um, you know, it's, it's making large changes to its default coefficients because it's learning rapidly that the, the race is important. And instead of having a coefficient near zero, it better be a very big coefficient because it really seems to matter as these games are played out. As you, as the number of games played gets into the millions and tens of millions, the, the operator can see that, that the, the coefficients are now hardly moving at all. In other words, it's reached its sort of stasis point where it believes that it has now mastered the game as well as it can given this set of coefficients. And that was the state where Tesoro kind of turned the program loose on me uh, back in 1990. And at that time, I, I was impressed. It was not as good as the best humans by any means, but it was a real player. You know, it was, I would say, uh, a weak open level player for the time. And he kept working on it. It got better and better. It, it eventually became a quasi commercial product, never sold well. But then came Jellyfish which was developed in Sweden by, um, you know, one of the one of the top Swedish mathematicians. Jellyfish was better than Tesoro's program, which he called TD Gammon, TD standing for temporal difference learning, which is what this approach is called. And then came Snowy and then came finally XG, each one being noticeably better than the one before after you know, a lot of programming and development and thought went into it. Um, each programmer built on the work of the people before him. Um, so XG is currently state of the art. Um, it doesn't play perfect backgammon, but it's real close. Uh, there are certain kinds of positions which you virtually never see in real play that it does not play particularly well. Um, however, normal positions, uh, no good player is going to argue with it. Uh, everybody who's any good learns from it, and it's a practice opponent. Um, I've got it on every computer I own, so I can play games whenever I feel like it. And it's just an essential tool. Uh, but that's how it's done. It, it, it's not it's not doing any work when it's playing except putting a position into its formula. And the output of the formula is the value of the position, as you say, plus 0.218. That comes out of the formula after it's cranked everything through all its little coefficients. Um, and then it does the same thing for the other reasonable choices and compares them and picks the best one. Rollouts would be a rollout using XG is slightly better than XG plus um, plus. A rollout will occasionally, you know, change the evaluation of the best play. Um, sometimes change it by a fair amount, but the rollout is sort of another another power up the scale, you know, because now you're forcing it to use its algorithm to play hundreds of games from the same position, and yeah, that will that will adjust things a little bit. No one claims that the current state of the art is perfect; it's just close, and and no one really 
argues with that anymore except some cranks on backgammon forums. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, always, uh, there's always a crackpot. Uh, whatever forum you've got, there's a crackpot there saying, uh, uh, my intuition allows me to. Oh, to yeah. Teach. They can never do it. Yeah. They can never actually demonstrate it. But they're, they assure you they have some deeper level of understanding than the, than the so-called machine. Well, there's one on the blackjack forums who insists that uh, simulations don't matter because you could never play a billion hands in your lifetime. <laughs> so, oh, what <laughs> clearer? Yeah. <laughs> there was one position in the book where most of the role was really clear, but then you had a random six to play at the end, and there were two main choices, and. You ended up with saying that humans will make this play, XG makes this play for reasons that are above my pay scale. Mm -hmm. Now, something like that. Um, Were you tempted not to include that hand because that shows you don't, you are more human than maybe you want to know? Or uh, do you think maybe XG got it wrong or what? No, I could have left it out. No, I don't think XG got it wrong. I could have left it out, but when I write a book, um, I don't want it to be too boring. So if you look at my books, you'll find, you know, divergences into the history of the game, how this came about, who played that, an amusing anecdote or two, if I can find one. And uh, when I got to this position, I just said, well, here's here's a good position. I can poke a little fun at myself and uh, maybe the reader will get a chuckle out of it. Um, also, it's possible. I, 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 I didn't. I, I think I could have, if I had done a lot of work, I probably could have come up with an explanation. But I just said, "Oh, this is. Uh, we'll put in a little comment here. This will be fun." I think it's important too, because there are just some things we are not going to understand, right? I mean, no matter right. how far we progress. I mean, so, and I, I, I think it's good to acknowledge that. So. Yeah, no, it's it's very true, uh, just as a statement of fact. Um, there are positions in backgammon which are not intuitively obvious, but if you do the if, if you were to sit down with pencil and paper and do the work of listing all the dice rolls and all of XG's evaluations after play A for each roll, and all of his evaluations after play B for each roll, and look at those columns and compare them. You might discover, you often will discover, that it's a single role that is swinging the play. That it's because, let's say, 4-3 is okay after play e, A, but terrible after play B. And that the difference for that single role is enough to basically toss the evaluation from A to B. But we can't do that over the board. We can get a general sense, you know, how likely are you to dance or how many hits do you have? Those are, you know, those those take us a little closer to the answer. But if if there's just one oddball rule that plays very badly one way and OK the other or, or, or very well the other, um, it's very hard to spot that over the board. That's not the way our minds work. And uh, an explanation based on that is not much of an explanation. You know, oh, okay, 5 1 is the swing roll here, and uh, because of that, yeah, everything else washes out, and, and that's why A is better than B. That, that's not going to tell you much. So uh, I, I could have gone there, but I didn't. I just said, eh, I'm going to poke a little fun at myself, and uh, that's, that's fine. Well, since Bill poked fun at himself, we're going to have some commercials now. We'll be back to poke more fun at Bill Roberti uh, <laughs> in a few minutes. South Point has more than 10,000 games returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In July, the free play with a kicker promotion is in effect for players who already get mailers. Pick up your normal mailer free play Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And if you do, you'll receive the same amount of free play on Friday or Saturday of the same week. Pick up all eight free plays and you receive a double amount of free play on Monday, August Second. 
Hey guys, this is Colin from blackjackapprenticeship.com and if you're serious about card counting, I'd encourage you to check out the Blackjack Apprenticeship membership. It has the training tools you'll need to beat the game like our comprehensive video course and our training suite so you can learn each skill and virtually test yourself before ever stepping foot in a casino. It also includes the tools you'll need to succeed like our pro betting software, casino database, results tracking software, and access to a community of like-minded advantage players to network with in our members forum and chat room software. You can find out more at blackjackapprenticeship.com. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. Game of the week, Powerhouse Poker. This is a 10 coins per line game where you get dealt extra hands, some with multipliers, when you're dealt a paying combination. For example, if you're dealt two pair, you may be given hands and four of them have multipliers from 4x to 8x. How many extra hands you get and how big the multipliers are varies from game to game. The extra hands start from the same position and same hold as you make. Let's say you're dealt two pair queens and fives in a game where it's correct to hold both pair, which is most games. Should you decide to only hold the queens, as many players incorrectly do, the extra hands will all start from holding the pair of queens. The game always returns more than the five-coin version of the same pay schedule, and no strategic variations are necessary in order to play the game accurately. It does add some more EV and some additional variants. All right, we're back to Bill Roberti. When I learned the game in the mid-70s, very few players would make their ace point in the early part of the game. And now they do, at least sometimes. It's certainly more so. What happened to to change the way good players play? Um, that was almost entirely the effect of the bots, although humans had begun to make progress in that direction in the late 80s, the early 90s. Um, the problem is that when you try to avoid making the ace point, what happens is that there are lots of positions where in order to avoid it, you have to get awkward structures, structures that are harder to improve. Um, and you don't want that. So sometimes you'll roll a double five. For example, your opponent split his back men. And you've got an option to point on the one. And, you know, that's going to be right a lot of the time because you got these, you've got these five fives, you got these four fives to play. And if you can't touch the checkers on your six point, uh, who gets to move? Um, it might be just the checkers on the midpoint. So, you know, the one point is not as valuable as other points in your board, but it's a point in your board. So it has some value. And if making the one point uh, preserves your flexibility around the rest of the board could well be right. And hey, it's a point. You know, your board's your board's always going to be a little more threatening to your opponent if uh, if you hit him. So it's it's not you know it's not entirely wasted. Um, but mainly you're making the ace really in two situations: one to preserve your flexibility. Um, the other thing is. If you had to hit on the ace, hit loose on the ace, and now you've got a blot there, that's a whole different story. Now you really want to cover that blot. You do not want that blot later on getting hit and costing you 24 pips in the race. So if you make a, if you have some opening play where you split your back checkers and hit him on your one point and he misses you, um, the next five you roll is going to be six to one. You're going to make that point because at least it's a point. At least it's not a blot anymore, and you have avoided the down-the-road problem of losing 24 pips in the race at some odd point later after you've hit a checker. And that was not appreciated in the 70s, because the 70s were focused on something different, you know, building a prime, blocking in your opponent, um, not putting any checkers behind your opponent. Those were, you know, those were rules that that we followed because we thought the prime was all. And the modern game says, yeah, the primes are important, but so is a lot of other stuff. 
Uh, having a strong board's important. Not getting hits important. They're all important. So you, you weigh priming plays now not as absolutes that must be, you know, honored, but simply that's just one tool in your toolkit. You got a bunch more and you have to use those two. So the ace point by default, since it, since we, we considered it to have you know, less than no value, uh, has risen up considerably to having some value. The recommended plays in this book generally don't take your opponent's style into consideration. Now, if you're playing Mochi, who uh, many consider to be the best world, the best player in the world, or an intermediate player, you make the same move. Whether you're playing an American player or a player from the Mideast who often have very different styles of play, you play the same. In most games, you take your opponent's style into account. Why is backgammon so different on this? Well, it's it's not different in terms of doubling strategy. Um, I you know the the problem with checker plays is what's a checker play that you want to play against a bad player that you wouldn't play against a good player? Uh, I'm going to make a point in either case because points are good. I'm going to run out my back checkers because I want to escape. Um, I'm trying no matter who I'm playing, I'm trying to make the best position I can. Um, and I don't have any reason particularly to make a different checker play against a weaker player because I, I say to myself, well, it's a different checker play, but uh, he'll misplay this position and not that position. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, I don't know, but um, that's not a place I'm going to vary. However, cube action against a weaker player can be very different. And, uh, you know, for that's example, the book. <laughs> That's the, the cube action in the opening is discussed in book three. Uh, it's, it's a it's a smallish chapter because there's a lot of cube action in the opening. But um, but here's uh, here's the, the sort of thing you might do. You're you're playing a weak player. Uh, you hit him. He he rolls double sixes and dances. You can sort of tell from the disgusted look on his face that he doesn't like his game much anymore. Um, in that case, you double it. Will it work? Will he drop? Maybe. But if he only drops half the time, I'm way ahead on the double. So, you know, that that's an example of a, a psychological play you can make against a poor player. If I'm playing a good player, I just try to play good backgammon and, and uh, hope I come out on top. But against a weaker player, you can pick up on cues. You know, the, the weaker player, weaker players don't want to do something that's embarrassing. That's a key idea when when you're playing a weaker player, if you have a reputation and, and he's a quasi beginner or something, weak intermediate, uh, the, the thing that's going on in his head is he expects to lose, but he doesn't want to do anything that embarrasses himself. Well, taking a cube and getting gammon, that's embarrassing. OK, that that basically says to him, oh, I made a stupid play. I got gammon, ah, blah, blah. So you can exploit that. You can double positions that are not quite doubles. Uh, or sometimes that aren't even close to doubles, if you know he's scared of being gammon and doesn't want to embarrass himself and will give up a point rather than take the risk of losing four and, and you know, having his girlfriend tell you, how could you take that cube, you fool? I want to so, I want to play devil's advocate for a second. Um, sure. So first of all, I would liken this to uh, game theory optimal in poker, right? If you play game theory optimal – that is the optimal way to play, but if you have knowledge of your opponent, you can you can make your edge even bigger. And in the and certainly in backgammon with Q play, um, as you say, you can make your edge even bigger. But I, w I the thinking was at least in the late seventies, eighties, that if you're playing a weak player, there are certain pl positions they do not understand. And the more complicated you make the game, the bigger your edge. So um, there was there was a move to slot more points, get more hitting uh, for both of you back and forth. You both end up with more men back. The games become more complicated. Your edge becomes bigger, uh, you know, against that weaker player. Like Jim Pasco used to love to put people into back games just because they played them so poorly. So. Um, yeah, I, I think there may be possibilities to uh, alter checker play to uh, 
uh, against weak players to make things more cl- complicated and against, uh, you know, a much stronger player, uh, you know, I would love to get into a race as much as possible because I'm much less likely to screw it up. Yeah, I mean, that's true, but I don't think it's true to the extent that it sounds like it should be true. Um, you know, in chess, you play a weaker player, you can complicate the game and they have no chance, but they don't have a big chance anyway. Um in backgammon, when you make an inferior play, it doesn't always work out the way you expect. You know, you, you, you leave some blots to maybe get into a back game, and he hits the blots, but you don't really get your back game. You get all your men piled on the 21 point or something. Um, it sounds clever. It sounds like it should work. When it does work, you you sort of score that up as another example of how good this strategy is and you tend to forget the times you try to complicate the game and it didn't work out very well um you know i used to play that way and uh, more and more i i just try to play correct back in uh whatever that is whatever i think that is in this position i'll go that way um the real danger of trying to play a back game, you know, don't forget, nowadays you don't really play any really bad players. They, they, they don't really exist even in open tournaments. But the danger of trying to play a back game against a weak player, get into a complicated position, is that you don't quite get a back game or you, you don't get a game that's very good to play at all. And, you, you know, you, you don't want to ignore those because they happen too. Um, whereas you just keep playing good moves against a bad player, you're just kind of piling up, you know, invisible equity in the bank up upstairs. And uh, over a long period of time, it, it works out fine. So uh, I, I, I used to subscribe to that view. I don't anymore. I just try to make good moves. Well, this is book two. Part three is in the works. This book says it'll be coming out before the end of this year. What will it cover? It covers, let's see, splitting and slotting. That's a, that's chapter 11. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Splitting and slotting, um, running, uh, bringing down builders, playing in the outfield. Um, there's a big chapter on how your play changes when you have escaped a checker and how your play changes when you've escaped both checkers. That's a, that's a big section. And then finally, there's a chapter on uh, doubling in the opening in positions that are not blitzes. Most early doubles happen when you're blitzing the guy. Like he splits his back man, you roll double fives, he dances, you double. Uh, okay, that's a double in the opening, but it's a blitz position, and that's really something to be covered in a book on blitzes. Um, so the, the, the opening doubles that I look at are positions which are not blitzes, they aren't you know, positions with five or six men back on some side. They're just kind of normalish positions where it turns out, yeah, you have a double here now. Uh, I think the, the, the chapter that will be most surprising to people will be the one, will be what happens when you escape a checker? Like you roll six, five on the first or second move. Um, turns out when you escape a checker, uh, your play leans much more heavily towards safety. Uh, you don't play totally safe. You don't have to, but you know, you can, you can leave a builder on the 11 or a builder on the 10, but your need to be safe goes up a lot once you escape the checker. Um, once you've escaped both back checkers, you play like a beginner, literally. You just play safe if you can. Stack checkers on the six. Hey, if that's all you can do, no problem. Um, a lot of players aren't aware of that it looks so unnatural to a player who's learned how to, you know, place builders and take small risks, that it, it sort of looks like you, you've lost your mind. But no, that's that's how you play when your back checkers are are, are escaped. You, you do not want to go back. You want to, you know, if you have to leave a blot eventually, you leave the fewest shots and you just hope you don't get hit. But you don't volunteer shots. Where is the best place to buy this book? I recommend uh, www.thegammonpress.com, which is about the only place to buy it until I start shipping it to Amazon, which will happen in a couple of months. 
And if our listeners wish to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do it? Same website. Uh, there's a there's a place there where you can send me a message, and uh, I will answer it. Good. Uh, thank you, Bill. Okay. I, uh, both Richard and I are ex backgammon players and still have a love for the game. And uh, it's fun, at least to the host. I hope it's fun for the listeners as well. Hey, come on back. Uh, last year was an incredible boom year for backgammon. Really? Although there weren't any live tournaments, the uh, the leading online site, which is Backgammon Galaxy, um, went from, I think, 5,000 members at the, at the start of the year, which was when I signed up, to 70,000 members at the end of the year. Wow. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people... A lot of people of, of our generation, you know, who played in the 70s and 80s and gave up the game and started a business, did their work and whatever, you know, now they're uh, they're, they're thinking, gee, that was a fun game. I want to get back into it. And they're usually doing it through the online sites to start with. Well, Jake just mentioned to me yesterday that I guess the Vegas tournament is going to be down at the Golden Nugget in November uh, this mm-hmm. year. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's coming up for it. He may talk me into going down there. I don't, yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, is uh, is Markowitz still running? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't been to the Vegas backgammon tournament in a long time, but um, I haven't heard anything has happened to him. So my guess would be yes. Yeah, I, I I had heard that he was. I assume we're off the air now. That's, no, uh, okay. no, 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 we're still on. <laughs> oh, okay. Still on. Okay. Yeah. No, I uh, I haven't been to Vegas since I think 2018 might have been my last time. But yeah, I'd like to go back. So if it starts up again in November, I'll I'll try to be there. Well, give me a uh, give me an email when you do. We, uh, okay. Okay. Might do a drink somewhere. Um, <laughs> So at the end of our show, we have a recommended section. Richard, what do you have as a recommendation today? Uh, Well, I want to talk about Korean food in Las Vegas, Korean barbecue. So um, on the west side of town, in Chinatown, uh, my favorite place is called Hobok, and it's on Spring Mountain between Decatur and Jones. Uh, That's really good. And but if you if you're out on the east side of town. Um, over near just east of the South Point, there's a place at, at Mark's and Sunset called Mr. Kim. And, uh, the thing I like about Mr. Kim is, uh, you know, it's one of these, you know, you order all you can eat kind of thing, but they have all these side dishes that are sort of fusion or something. So they, ha- that all come included. So they have things like bulgogi tacos. And stuff that uh, that come with it. Anyway, good food at both places if you like Korean barbecue. So, um, and we'll have links in the show notes to both those places. And when he said just east of the South Point, he meant just east of Sunset Station. That's yes. I'm sorry, <laughs> Sunset Station. Yeah. They're uh, they're not. They're, they're two different I don't places. Know, yeah. Eight mi- yeah, eight miles apart from each other, something like that. I don't know. All right, my recommendation is from one of our sponsors, uh, Colin Jones, Blackjack Apprenticeship. He posted a new video called Six Things I Wish I Knew Before Becoming a Card Counter. And this is good for people just coming up. A lot of the things in the video uh, would apply to video poker as well or any kind of gambling situation. So um, you can find it on YouTube and probably Amazon or probably um, Apple under the uh, blackjackapprenticeship.com uh, free videos. So, no. Bill Roberti, do you have a recommended for somebody, for us? Uh, yeah, I'll recommend a good book I'm reading. Uh, I was curious about uh, finding a book that discussed climate change in a sort of balanced way and and – went back into the history of the Earth's climate, and there there is such a book. It's called Unsettled, and um, I'm plowing through it now, but it's uh, it's well done and full of, you know, full of the history of the Earth's climate up to now, which is good to know about. So I'll recommend that. Bob, I, 
I, I have a second recommended that just occurred to me. Um, for our listeners that um, get the show on YouTube or, or uh, other places, uh, I, I would recommend James Grossjean has come back to writing regularly at gamblingwithanedge.com. So um, for people who weren't aware of it, he's been posting every week for the, about the last month. And uh, I highly recommend that um, you you check out his regular uh, postings at gamblingwithanedge.com. I echo that one. Very good. So thank you, Bill Roberti. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>